uh, these next couple pictures are really kind of special. Um, they come to us from Aussie Airliners, a group down in Australia that kind of has tracked the history of this airplane. Um, this is an image of your actual Sunderland uh, when it was still approximately in its post-war Mark V configuration. Um, interestingly, and, and Kermit, you can tell us a little bit about this in a moment. Um, it was in storage with the Royal New Zealand Air Force and was actually requested uh, to be transferred to Australia to be converted into a kind of post-war civilianized version uh, to operate with Ansett Airlines after they lost uh, one of their purpose-built uh, flying boats that was servicing the Lord Howe route. So Kermit, as we look at this, you know, we can see this is its delivery flight and it arriving in Australia. Um, you can still see its uh, RNZAF registration underneath the white paint that's been applied to the rear fuselage and uh, this is it obviously landing as well you can see it still has um, the bomb the bomb bay doors here on the yeah. side of the airplane the bombs actually come out on rails and extend under the wing Kermit can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to land one of these on the water as we're looking at these great images? Um, it's really not especially choppy. Can, can you talk about the sort of maximum sea conditions for the airplane and, and what it's like to try to operate it from maybe not the calmest of waters? When I bought this airplane, I had a single engine seaplane rating in a Piper Cub, okay? <laughs> single engine Piper Cub. I, later, I got the Grumman Duck, you know, so I'm flying a you know, World War II airplane with a 1200 horsepower. So I'd flown, I got a single engine. When I bought this, I had to go get a multi-engine seaplane rating, okay? So I went down to uh, the local place here. I got a multi-engine seaplane rating with a twin CB, okay? So everybody knows what a twin C is. It's a little small thing got two engines okay and and it took me about two and th two and a half three hours and i had my rating okay okay the next plane i flew was this thing across the atlantic okay and when we did the test flight because the airplane hadn't flown in two years uh the guy who had been flying the airplane was in the left seat i was in the right seat i got a kind of a dispensation from the because it's still under british registration when we flew at home okay and uh because we could not for in American, we had to go under experimental exhibition. So the FAA won't do that. You have to be in the United States to get that experimental exhibition. So we had to fly it over on the British registry. So I had to, I got a special dispensation from the British CAA to be able to fly right seat in this, okay? So the first two flights were, I was in the right seat. And, you know, I'd practice looking at all the checklists and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and the first time we flew it, I oh, that's pretty cool, blah, blah, blah. Then he goes, and we went a little bit outside the, the mouth of the, the Solent there, and it was a little bit more choppy. Man, he crashed this thing on. And I'm thinking to myself, what have I got myself into? Well, then after that, after his second flight, I did all the flying from the left seat. I was in the left seat, and uh, as you can see here, you see how the left wing is slightly dipped down? Well, part of that is because of the torque of the engines turning to the right. And th at first, you know, there was no horizon on the, the panel because it has kind of a curved panel. And I couldn't really tell that that left float was, you know, in the water or whatever. And so what we did is we got a piece of string and we tied it across the, the, the panel above the panel, you know, so we had an artificial horizon. It was a piece of string. And so from then on, you know, I would, I would always start off with full right aileron, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I got that figured out. But uh, man, I got, I, and you, you have to, when you fly this thing and you land, you got to realize you can, when you hit that buoy, if you have the engines running really at any kind of speed, you're going to overrun the buoy if there's no wind. Okay. So the first thing you do is cool the engines down and you shut the inboards down. And then you basically taxi around, you line up with the buoy coming in from downwind. Okay. And we always in Florida here, since we don't have a, uh, a, a tide and in the Solent when we were flying there was like a six or eight foot tide so sometimes the wind you'd show one thing but the tide was moving the current the other way and only one time ever did I miss the buoy and it was because of the tide but basically 
uh, and this I talk about this a little more on my video on YouTube, but basically you, now what you're doing is you're steering the airplane, you're downwind of the buoy, so you're pointed into the wind, you're steering the airplane with the outboard engines, but even with the engines all the way back, you're going to overrun the buoy. So what you do is when you get, you line up, you try and be right behind the little telltale buoy, which we have a, we have a buoy with a rope on it that basically goes downwind. So you're going into it. So you know you're directly into the wind if you don't have a current, okay, or a tide. And so basically you're lined up with that. When you finally get lined up with that, you never, you pull the throttles all the way back and you don't touch them again, okay? So now what you do, because the wind's on the nose, you sail the airplane. So what you do is, if you want, uh, if you want to turn to the right, you turn the the ailerons to the left, and the and the right aileron goes down because it's so far out. The wind will get it; it will turn the nose to the right, and then the airplane will start steering to the right. So once you get within about a couple hundred yards from the buoy. You're sailing the airplane with the rudder and the ailerons to keep it going straight with the engines all the way back. But you're still going too fast. You're going to overrun the buoy. So then what you have to do is when you get really close and you've almost got it made, you got the, the mag switches are above you on the top of the cockpit. You start basically pulling the mags off to slow you down and to steer the airplane. So if I want to go to the right, I shut the right engine off with the mag switch. The left engine's still running. It turns me slightly. And before the right engine quits, I push the switch back in so it'll start again. And eventually when you're getting really close, you're pulling both switches off. And before they, you see what I'm getting? Then, then when the guy finally picks up the buoy in the front, he gives you a thumbs up and then you shut the engine down on the outboard. So. And Amazing. presumably breathe a giant sigh of relief. Yeah, then, then the rum comes out. <laughs> Make it in Jamaica. Kermit, the, uh, the airplane in the pictures, obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about how it was converted a little later in the presentation. But you've chosen not to turn it back, your airplane, back all the way into a Sunderland uh, of wartime configuration. Can you talk a little bit about why you've chosen to keep the airplane as a kind of monument to the, the era of the great passenger flying boats? Well, okay, this airplane was built as a Sunderland Mark III, okay? And I was going to ask you to go back to some previous pictures, but they're pretty far back, so I won't. But the original engines in this were Bristol Hercules, and the British engines actually spun the other way. If you look at the pictures here, this spins pretty much the way all American airplanes spin. And if you're in the cockpit, it spins, you know, clockwise to the pilot, okay? And so basically, this airplane was originally built with the Bristol Hercules, and the engines spun to the left, okay? And uh, they were sleeve valve engines, and they, they had, are you ready for this? This airplane has 16 hours of endurance, okay? The British Hercules engines did not have feathering propellers, okay? So if you're eight hours, seven hours out off the shore and you lose an engine, you can't even feather the propeller. So somewhere along the line, somebody got the idea, the British had been flying PBY Catalinas and they said, you know, let's try putting some PBY Catalina QECs on the Sunderland. And so this airplane eventually went back and was upgraded at the factory to a Mark V, and those are basically, you know, in effect, an evolution of the PVY QECs. So now the engines turn to the right, they have feathering propellers, and uh, that was, a, I think that was a big help, and probably a lot of the pilots of the day probably, you know, wiped their brow, the sweat off their brow. <laughs> So you've chosen to keep the passenger interior in it and everything largely as you found it. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your kind of desire to share the stories of, of the great era of the, the passenger flying boats? Yeah, well, to basically finish follow up with your question there, um, first of all, to convert it back to a Sunderland would be a monumental task. The parts availability, I mean, finding turrets and blah, blah, blah. And the more I thought about it, you know, and, it, and truly it was a consideration uh, early on because there, there's a few things here and around that I kind of serve. But in the long run, in the long run, I realized the significance to me in history of the flying boat was not the military application. It was the romantic era of the passenger flying boat 
you know, Pan Am Clipper Boeings and Martin Clippers and stuff, you know. So, uh, so this actually has a double deck. And there, when you get in that door in the front there, you know, you go in, there's a lower deck. This thing will hold 36 passenger people in the configuration it's in. And you go in the back there, you can go up a little staircase, and there's like a first-class lounge up there with a little bar, okay? And so when we got the airplane, um, it was in this configuration. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I need to leave it this way. And also, too, a little bit of history. Um, there, after the war, there obviously wasn't a lot of need for flying boats, especially in military configuration, because they built all these runways around the world. And that was kind of the demise of the flying boat, because they were trying to get bombers and things to different uh, theaters of the war. And so with all these runways, which was the reason why, if they didn't have a runway, you could get there on a flying boat. And so the Lord Howe run, which was basically flying out of Rose Bay in Sydney to an island about halfway to New Zealand that didn't have a runway, uh, that's how they used to get passengers back and forth. Well, finally, they built a runway on the island, and that was the end of that. And so uh, this airplane was converted by Ansett Flying Boats. So the Australians did a conversion there. Now, the, the, a, the, a lot of the military Sunderlands went back to the factory in Belfast after the war. They were converted by the factory into a passenger flying boat, and it was called a Sangringham. So the sister ship to this in Southampton, and the airplane that this replaced that was damaged and lost in a storm on Lord Howe Island, and that's why Ansett bought this one from uh, the New Zealand Air Force, this airplane was not a factory conversion. So from an FAA perspective, I cannot fly passengers for hire in this airplane because it was not a factory conversion. So, you know, I thought about a couple of things that'd be really cool to be able to do that. So somewhere down the road, I, I really have no interest to make it a military airplane. Um, so somewhere down the road is there's an opportunity to become a licensed station for the, com the company or the organization that owns the shorts, uh, you know, Sunderland's type certificates, and we convert it to a Sangringham, and then we can fly. I don't know. That would be a dream of mine, uh, and it would be a hell of a lot easier than building a Boeing 314 Clipper from scratch. <laughs> So you've got us onto the subject of Clippers, which is well-timed. Um, you had the opportunity to relive some of those glory days of, of the romantic era of flying boats. Um, you actually are the last person to have taxied a four-engine flying boat up to the uh, the old Pan Am Clipper base in Miami. That's now City Hall down there. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about that particular experience? Yeah, this is, uh, that's a Sikorsky S-42 landing in the distance. This is uh, Biscayne Bay. It's uh, basically Coconut Grove now. They call this Dinner Key. It was a little island there. They kind of filled it in. It's mostly a marina now. But basically, this was the original Pan Am Clipper base to fly down to the Caribbean out of uh, Miami. And uh, uh, like you said, it's now the Miami City Hall. Uh, there were some hangars kind of over to the left of this circular parking lot there. They used to operate a Coast Guard hangar there. It's all basically uh, boats. But if you go to Coconut Grove, this building is still there. And if you go inside, oh my God, it is so cool. It's all Art Deco. Uh, and this is a bit of an inspiration for the, uh, the, the seaplane base terminal that I want to build at Fantasy of Flight in Act 3 Part 2. And if you see, there's a little bit of an upper deck. You see some people over there watching the flying boat land. And we're going to have an upper deck restaurant, blah, 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 and the little circular drive and all that stuff. It's going to be really, really cool. Plus some hangers over to the left. It'll all be period. And uh, inside, if you if you get a chance, any of the, the uh, uh, listeners here, you know, go do a research on the original deal and look at some of the pictures inside this building. And it's still pretty much kept that way. There was a big globe that was in the middle of the floor that was painted that I might even, I, it revolved, I think, at the time. It was in the middle of the terminal building there and where you got your tickets and all that stuff. And I was painted as a globe. Well, that globe eventually got moved out of here because they didn't need it in the middle of, you know, doing committee meetings in Miami City Hall. And it ended up down at the Museum of Science, I believe, just down uh, the road there uh, in Coconut Grove. So anyway, 
a really cool thing and it's an inspiration for something that I want to build one day. I don't know if we're going to do it exactly like this, but what I want to do is I want to do something that has this feel, maybe combined a little bit with Treasure Key, you know, in San Francisco, which was the second Pan Am Clipper base that basically launched people off, you know, to the to the Pacific out of San Francisco. It's certainly an amazing period in history. Kermit, you were actually able to fly up and taxi up next to it because you carried the Olympic torch on board your aircraft. Can you tell us a little bit more about what led to that set of circumstances and what it was like to carry something like as special as the Olympic torch on board the airplane? Yeah, this it was it was pretty cool. I can't remember how we got connected to this, but uh, this was the Olympic torch relay to the uh, uh, 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, and of course, what they do is if 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 the they bring the flame over from from Greece, okay, and they basically bring the Olympic flame over, and when it's in an airplane, like an airliner or something like that, it's in kind of a three-part thing. The flame's lit, and it's protected to where it's not going to catch the airplane on fire, okay? So, uh, but then, once it gets over here, and they start the run, and everybody gets to, you know, run the torch, then it's an actual torch that has a flame, you know? And I was fortunate enough, we bought one, as a souvenir and put a little thing in, it's in a, it's hanging in my executive conference room. We flew the airplane down to Sarasota, uh, Sarasota Bay, and the torch was run out uh, from the city and it was put on a dock on a police boat. And we had landed, we got there a couple hours early and we were sitting there just anchored, you know, cause we weren't gonna moor for the night. So we just basically landed in the bay and anchored and they kind of knew where we were gonna get. And we thought, yeah, no big deal. They're going to bring this up. And they were going to give it to us in one of these little containers, which is what the guy's holding there in his hand, okay? It's not the normal torch that you run with, okay? Well, we thought, okay, we'll pick up the torch and we'll go. Well, what I didn't realize is when the police boat came out, there was this wall of freaking pleasure boats behind him. And I'm going, oh my God, how are we going to get out of here without freaking getting somebody? Okay. We never touched the torch. It was brought out uh, by this guy. And then we got the torch. Then we had to start one of the engines and I'm going, you know, I've got my guy up there like waving everybody away. So once we started, and you got to remember, once you start the outboard engine, you're moving and you're turning. OK, and until you can get that other engine going, you've got no way to steer the airplane. OK, so the first one gets started. Now we're moving. Now we're turning. We're chewing everybody away. The boats are trying to stay out of the way. Now we get the other one going. And then once we got a little bit of speed and moving and people kind of moved away, we kind of got away from everybody, started the other two engines, you know, let them warm up, did our run up and we took off. And so I was the longest relay of the games there because I flew the torch 200 miles from Sarasota Bay. We landed in Biscayne Bay, made a couple of passes. We landed in the bay and I'm the last person to taxi up and fly a four engine flying boat into the original Pan Am Clipper base. That's pretty cool. And what was even cooler, but I gotta tell you before this, so we get down there and we've done all this preparation and we'd spent all this time, we put all this effort into it and we get down there and blah, blah, and there's all these people standing on the dock and blah, blah, and I don't know, there's a, a famous flute player called Nestor Torres and he was the one that was gonna receive the torch down on the dock, okay? So we're sitting there and there's all these people and everybody's looking and taking pictures. And I went down with the torch and I'm in the boat and I go over there and we sit there and we pull up to the ding and everybody's watching, taking pictures. They hand the torch to the guy. He runs off and everybody leaves. And I'm like, that's it? That's it? Oh my God, it was the biggest letdown. Anyway, so we had dinner somewhere that night. And then the next night, I think, uh, or it might've been that night, it was, it was the... 100th year anniversary, 100th year anniversary of Miami or something. And we weren't supposed to be drinking, but we were. And we went out in a police boat and, uh, you know, we weren't flying or anything. We weren't operating the boat, but uh, we were out there and, and we were in this police boat watching all these fireworks out over the water, you know, because it was 100th anniversary of celebration of Miami. It was really cool. Um, anyway, so we ended up, uh, you know, we flew back the next day. And that's the last time the airplane flew. That was in 1996. So, uh, we went ahead and parked it and uh, 
uh, one day when we get it down and get the seaplane base going, you know, we'll we'll take another look at it. Kermit, uh, we've got a really good sort of side-on view of the airplane in its ANSET flying boats livery, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how the conversion was done uh, in the next couple of slides. Can you perhaps provide people a rundown uh, based on looking at this airplane this way as to kind of how the lower deck is configured and you know how that bar is positioned on the upper level, um, just so people can get a kind of sense of how the airplane is put together in terms of its cabin? Yeah, well, basically, the green line down the middle of the airplane is a, probably a little bit below the floor line. But as you can imagine, you can have a deck about where the water level is. And, and basically, when people are sitting in the chairs down below, they're basically eye level looking out those windows. So if you would stand up in the, in the cabin there, uh, you know, the windows would be below you. And then back where it says ANSET, there was a little stair that went up uh, halfway. You would make a 90 degree turn to the left. You could look back in the tail and then you would go up another little stair. Uh, so the stair basically had a dog leg. Uh, and then in the upper deck, those windows were added. Those weren't there as part of a World War II airplane. And there was a little bit of a second deck and somebody put, I mean, it wasn't really, it was not very elaborate by any means. That's kind of where the airplane uh the same configuration. So she was called Islander at that point, and uh, here's here's a kind of later livery that she wore. Kermit, can can you tell us a little bit about how you get the boats out of the way? Uh, this is departing Rose Bay in Sydney to take people to Lord Howe Island. Um, obviously, a very interesting service that they ran, but uh, one of the last really revenue driving passenger carrying flying boat operations in the world. What do you do, what do you know about that operation and and basically how do you safely operate from the water safety should be obvious with you know they, they've always got launches that are watching them and you know and that kind of stuff you know and uh, you know people uh, obviously if they're operating i think they can dodge the uh, you know the boats and stuff but uh ansett flying boats once lord howe uh, built a runway that was the end of the days here there's a youtube clip there that you can find uh, that the Australians did and kind of reminisced about it. Um, but what happened was a famous Pan Am pilot, Charlie Blair, who eventually, eventually married uh, the actress Maureen O'Hara, uh, he was a famous thing. He bought these two airplanes from Ansett Flying Boats. They flew both airplanes back uh, to the Caribbean. And I got to tell you, too, this airplane and the one that's in the Southampton Flying Museum are the only ones that have flown completely around the world. Mine went east out of, after the war, east down to New Zealand, and then eventually it flew east continuing to the Caribbean, and then eventually it flew east to England. So this, my, this airplane's flown all around the world. And what, so when Charlie Blair got it, he flew both of them, this one and the sister ship, which was a Belfast converted Sangringham, he flew him back to uh, operated him out of, I think, Puerto Rico, somewhere down around there. He was going to fly him out of the Caribbean. And when he got him here to license him, the FAA said, oh, you can't, this one you can't fly for passengers or hire because it was not a Sangringham. So mine is considered a modified Sunderland. It is not a Sangringham. It's a modified Sunderland. And because of that fact, I can't fly passengers for hire with the FAA. I probably could in England. So the only way we're ever gonna be able to legally fly passengers is to convert this somehow legally paperwork wise into a Sangringham, which like I said, would be a dream of mine because actually the Sangringham configuration is like a cool old flying boat. And this one was just really done at a level to just fill some passenger seats because it was like a four hour flight over and back to Lord Howe Island. So. You know, uh, anyway, at some point it'd be nice to do that, but we can all dream, can't we? Certainly. Um, we've got a couple images here, Kermit, of the airplane undergoing uh, the modifications to become the, the civilianized version of itself. I, I thought they might be interesting for people to see um, what followed those earlier sequence of images when it was arriving at the shops in Rose Bay. Um, obviously, here they've removed that nose turret. Um, we've had a question asked about how they were how you're still able to service the mooring buoy and, and get outside the nose of the airplane with the turret removed. Um, this next image, I think, should 
go some distance to helping that. Uh, they actually fared it over and included a hatch. Kermit, yours has a kind of a telltale bump in the nose that isn't there on a factory converted Sandringham uh, that, uh, that leads to some of the problems with perceiving the horizon out of that airplane from what I'm told. Um, no, I don't think the horizons, the, the horizon issue is not that bump. The horizon issue is, is the panel has a big curve to it. And when you're looking at, you know, basically the top of a beach ball, you can't tell if you're level or not. So that's why we put the string there. It doesn't appear to look that way in the picture, but, but it is at some level. Um, yeah, I don't know why they put that bulbous nose in there, uh, except to give the, 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 the bowsman some head clearance. But originally, when the turret was there, there was a little crank and the turret would actually retract back into the airplane. And so probably a lot of that structure up there uh, might have been kind of almost already there. They would have built up the front part of it. But, uh, but the turret actually used to come back into the airplane. The guy would go under or around the turret to get up into the front to pick up the, the mooring buoy. Just another picture here from the factory that is showing the tail cone uh, being fared over. Obviously, there was a gun position in the tail as well um, during the war, but was enclosed. Yeah. This is a, an interesting photo that came to us from Aussie Airliners as well that actually shows Islander beached on Lord Howe Island. Uh, part of the reason the flying boats were so useful in the service was it's a somewhat underdeveloped island and is a, a kind of a rocky outcrop about 500 miles uh, off the coast of Australia. And uh, this is them using manpower to put the airplane back in the water after it had uh, a maintenance issue that led to an unfortunate beaching. And this is what happened to the airplane uh, that this replaced. I mean, it was lost in a storm, you know, run up on the beach, uh, and the damage was so much that they had to scrap the airplane. Um, and more than likely, the other airplane, the Sangringham and the Sam Southampton Museum, which was called Beachcomber, more than likely, it probably ended up on the beach at some point in its life, too. So this was... Uh, you know, once they got the runway there, that was the that was the end of this. They they just didn't need the didn't need the service anymore. And it was a little bit of a kind of a not an atoll, but a bit of a bay there that they could land the airplane in. You know, they kind of kept it out of the choppy waters. But uh, you know, like I said, you know, if you're sitting there and you're moored and a storm comes, or uh, you know, it's like having a baby in a forest of wild animals. You know, it just comes with the territory, and uh, sometimes you don't sleep at night. <laughs> Certainly a sentiment that I think anyone who owns a boat can relate to. It's somewhat more unusual for an airplane. 